Rick Pitino is out. Sports Illustrated has been called out for sloppy journalism, a fan protest against racism at a Cardinals-Brewers game. Melo's departure was very upsetting to a teammate. Can the New York Mets rebound from turmoil? And who and what are off topic this week? All that and more on What's the 401 Sports, coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's good to see you. You too, Keisha. And good to see all of our friends in TV land. But let's get started because Rick Pitino is out of a job, at least for now. The University of Louisville has placed men's basketball head coach Rick Pitino on unpaid administrative leave after FBI allegations that coaches within the program participated in a scheme to pay recruits' families in exchange for commitments to pay, I mean play, sorry, for the university. Mike, do you think that Louisville kept Pitino on too long, and what do you think is the fallout from this investigation? A huge fallout. To answer the first question, absolutely they kept him on, Keisha. This has been just disgraceful, the way that this university has carried this on. This is not one issue where it's just come out with this FBI investigation. In this show, we've reported numerous instances going back over the past couple of years now with the escort scandal that they had and, of course, the NCAA violations that were issued earlier this year. Uh, there's no question about it that Louisville should have sat down with Rick Pitino and tried to come up with some type of solution to everything that was going on. And let's be honest, they should have pushed him out the door. Everything that's happened right now, this is just a complete mess. Another fallout from this situation, without a doubt, out is Rick Pitino's legacy. This is one of the most prominent basketball coaches going back for the last 25, 30 years or so. And what he's done here with Louisville, I mean, this is just, to me, there's no excuse for it. I think as far as the NCAA is concerned, one of the other fallouts that this is going to lead to is a lot of other investigations that haven't necessarily come to surface yet, but other schools where they're really going to have to start cracking down as to how these AAU coaches and these sneaker companies are involved with these basketball programs and specifically these high school athletes. I mean, we can go on and on about this, but everything that's happened with Louisville and Rick Pitino, it just makes you, it, it really just puts a bad taste in everybody's mouth. Well, I'm just going to slightly disagree with you because I'm a firm believer in second chances, so I don't think that they kept him on a little too long, but this was definitely the, fi the final straw, and I think this is really the right move for Louisville because you can't have scandal after scandal marring the university and its reputation. So Rick Pitino is definitely um, right, right now on leave, but I think it's just one step out of the door. And the fallout is going to be huge because this is going to uncover more schools. As the accused are being rounded up by the FBI and they start singing, there are going to be more and more schools, perhaps other individuals in the sneakers, in the sneaker companies that are going to be exposed. So um, I'm just hoping that my, my school is not caught up in anything <laughs> illicit. I, I have faith in Coach K. Um, and then also, I think that this might be the impetus to have some sort of reform in, when it comes to a high school and college and the NBA because right now, the way the system is, it's a breeding ground for stuff like this to happen. These high school athletes, most do not come from wealthy backgrounds or middle class. And when you start throwing money at them, their families, the family friends, it's very tempting to take it because I remember when um, Laramie Tonsil, the football draftee who got in tr into trouble for accepting money while he was in college, one of the things that he asked for was money for the electric bill. So this is a l life, real life for some people. So the way, when you keep people from earning money by telling them you have to go to college in order to get to the NBA, to get to the contracts, then, you know, there's a year of what am I going to do? How is my family going to survive that the NCAA has not addressed and the NBA, you know, hasn't addressed either. So I think there might be some reform. It's going to be a battle because if you start telling the kids they can go from high school to the NBA, where does that leave the NCAA? Does that affect their pocket. So it, it's going to be it's going to be very, very interesting. And I'd really be surprised if there wasn't any kind of reform instituted. Absolutely. 
Well, Keisha, we move on to the big hot topic in sports right now, especially with Sports Illustrated, who capitalized off of the NFL-initiated sports protest with an iconic cover, but Colin Kaepernick was conspicuously absent from that cover. Keisha, do you buy Sports Illustrated executive editor Steve Canella's reason for Kaepernick's absence? Although he's not there, he's there. Sports Illustrated should be ashamed of themselves. I don't even know how you leave off the person who's responsible for a chain of events off your cover. You have Roger Goodell on the cover. Roger Goodell, the same person who has done little to nothing to investigate why people like Scott Tolzien, Mike Glennon, I've thrown these names in, and then recently Brandon Whedon just got signed to a contract because of, I think, in Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken, because Marcus Mariota is hurt. Kaepernick has not gotten a job, and Goodell has not done anything revolutionary to me in terms of these anthem protests or the issues that ignited Colin Kaepernick's protest to begin with. Then you have the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Shad Khan, on the cover. He was a person who donated a large sum of money to Donald Trump, who, to me, and maybe others, epitomizes the reason why these protests exist and the only reason and you know let's be clear Shah Khan said that he would not have any problem signing Kaepernick but did not invite him for a tryout because he's the Jacksonville Jaguars currently have Blake Bortles as their starting quarterback and Chad Heading as their backup quarterback and you can't tell me that Kaepernick cannot compete with either one of those two to for their for their job either as their starter or as their backup so I just think that what Sports Illustrated did was attempt to rewrite history, which is irresponsible and unacceptable. It's ima imagine putting, you know, talking about civil rights and leaving Rosa Parks out of the discussion, not putting her on the cover or something saying like that. Sports Illustrated, just come clean and say that you didn't like Colin Kaepernick, you didn't like his protests, you didn't like what he stood for, or you're a Trump supporter. Like, just come out and say that instead of this mealy mouth excuse. Yeah, this. I mean, from my standpoint, I thought that this was just an idiotic, with or without Kaepernick, I just thought that this was an idiotic cover where you're throwing all these people that whether or not they're protesting or whatever they're standing for, um, you're just throwing them all together. Just, I, I felt like having Roger Goodell with LeBron James and Steph Curry, it just didn't fit for me. I thought that this was really an opportunity for Sports Illustrated to go ahead and stand out and do something creative here. I thought that in some ways, by leaving Kaepernick out, out, you know, it almost shows that they want to avoid the controversy, but at the st same time, stir the pot where we're getting people to talk about it. Sports Illustrated at the same time is smart. It's not like it was 15, 25 years ago where the purpose of Sports Illustrated was to sell magazines. Now it's really all about generating traffic to their website. And really, I think in some ways they did succeed here where they're stirring the pot, they're getting people to talk about it, but they did so in such a disgraceful manner. I felt like the way that they just sort of pushed Kaepernick aside and didn't even, I mean, I actually looked at the article where obviously he had to be mentioned because he's really the one that revolutionized this, but this was just sloppy. I really thought that the way that they put all this out together, uh, it just was careless the way that they did this. And now, of course, as you pointed out, you know, Really, the big thing going forward is is what lies ahead for Colin Kaepernick. The Tennessee Titans, of course, made the decision not to go ahead and sign him and everything. It's just looking worse and worse, not just for uh, the NFL, but for people that are covering the NFL, like Sports Illustrated, when you get things like this to happen. Yeah, it's just interesting in how this protest has taken form, and I think it's really starting to move away from what the original intent or it was or purpose that Colin Kaepernick had. So. We'll see if there's any more covers like this. Yeah, I hope not. I hope that other publications would have learned from this gaffe. <laughs> Protests keep rolling on, and we'll move to the baseball diamond. And a fan at the Cardinals Brewers game unfurled a banner that featured the Cardinals mascot holding signs that said, quote, racism lives here, and quote, stop killing us. If you recall, Former police officer Jason Stockley was acquitted in the shooting death of Anthony Lamar Smith in St. Louis. Mike, do you think that sports arenas have become the battleground for civil protests? I think that they can be, as long as it's done sort of in a safe way, not just specifically with players who are protesting um, with the national anthem and everything, but... Um, 
with fans, as we've pointed out here, of course, the incident, there was another incident, I think, also earlier this season that happened following the Adam Jones situation that went down at Fenway Park. So I think absolutely, you know, the big thing that people seem to be forgetting about with with, with some of these protests that have happened is that um, people are coming out with this with this idea that, that the protesters or the people that these athletes that are standing up for a cause that they've sort of lost light as to what or, or lost sight as to what they're fighting for well specifically when Colin Kaepernick came out and he made this stand for what he or when he made his kneel for what he felt that he believed in it was really just sort of specific towards police brutality against African Americans or not just African Americans but minorities here throughout this country and I think as long as we have inc- incidents that are continuing to happen with black people who are getting pulled over by police, shot and killed, when they're not, things like that, you're going to see a growing trend of protests and things like this to happen, in specifically in sporting events. Uh, so I think, Keisha, without a doubt, with this divide that we have in this country, we're going to see a lot more of these situations occur. Yeah, I think that there's always been a marriage between sports and politics. We've seen boycotts of the Olympics. We've seen... Um, race uh, fists holding and, and during the Olympics because of you know some social and or political issues going on in respective countries. So there's always been this synergy. And the one thing that I like about this kind of protest is that the message does not get diluted with patriotism because it's not being done during something that's traditional. So this banner was displayed outside of the national anthem and that's where things have gotten really muddled when it comes to these anthems because they're happening during the national anthem and people are saying oh you know this is unpatriotic if you don't like the country you should leave and all this other stuff instead of focusing on the reason why people are kneeling people or people are sitting down or so i really like this kind of protest and it and it's on a public stage, so you know cameras are always ready to catch something like this. So I think that this will continue because there is a heightened sense of awareness and activism in this this day and age. So don't go away. When we come back, we'll have more of what's popping. And now we have some quick hits. Derrick Rose says that he is no longer in a quote unquote dark place, and he is happy in Cleveland. Russell Westbrook signed a five-year, $205 million extension with the Oklahoma City Thunder, and the mayor of the city declared every day Russell Westbrook Day. Staying in OKC, with Carmelo Anthony, Russell Westbrook, and Paul George on the roster, NBA analyst Steven Jackson says that OKC is the scariest team in the NBA. And staying in the hotbed that is OKC, Carmelo Anthony is ecstatic to be there. He told ESPN, quote, From an individual standpoint, I feel born again, feel rebirth, a different type of energy within myself. Around the guys, around the organization, around the city, you can feel it. And cue the music because it's reunited and it feels so good. Dwayne Rain has joined LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Mike, the, the Ball family has hit the big time. In the Lakers preseason opener, fans lined up to see not Lonzo, but his father, LeVar Ball. They lined up to shake his hand, take some pictures. What do you think uh, it is about LeVar Ball that has resonated with so many people that they would actually have a line to meet the father of an NBA player? I think it's his arrogant, cocky, macho personality that he's really just thrown at people over the course of the last couple of years, really to pump up, uh, you know, his the the careers of his children. I mean, I'll give this to to Levar Ball. You know, there are so many athletes, young athletes out there, who. You know, actually, you know, specifically basketball players, kids that are living in their, you know, their AAU coach's basement, or, or you know, there's a lot of kids that are absent of father figures or parental figures, and you got to give the guy credit. He's there for whether we agree or disagree. He's there. He's been providing for his children to say the least. 
from my standpoint, though, when someone, you know, it's one thing to just have a complete lack of humility when you're a successful person. It's another to have a complete lack of humility when you're living vicariously through your children. The way that this guy has sort of developed this connection, though, with fans, people that want to see him, we kind of got to give him some credit because there's no question, and Fox Sports and ESPN will agree with this, that this guy does have a personality that people are attracted to. Yeah, I mean, LeVar Ball is one of those people, you love him, you hate him, or you love to hate him. And I, I'm somewhere in the middle. I mean, I don't think I hate him. I don't love him. I guess I'm sort of in the middle. And you mentioned when you strip down everything to the bare minimum, he is a father who loves his kids and wants to put them in the best positions in life to succeed. So, And you can't be mad at that. You that's what a parent is supposed to do and I but I also think I think we as a society love rebels this is a guy who is willing to take on the shoe establishment the NCAA with no fear and anybody else for that matter who's going to get in his path to what he wants to accomplish and think about it major points in our history were built on rebellion and we wouldn't be a free country if we don't rebel. So I think, or maybe it's just me. Maybe I love a, a good rebel. I don't know. But there is something about him that, you know, draws people to him. And if it's just because you want to give him, build him up to take him down, he's just got something, a little something. But, you know, good for him. Well, Keisha, speaking of basketball, Stan Van Gundy, Detroit Pistons head coach, came up with a novel idea to eliminate tanking in the NBA, and that is to eliminate the NBA draft altogether. Do you think Stan is onto something, or is this the most ridiculous idea yet? Hmm. I don't know, because I'm trying to imagine life without a draft and what it would mean to the draftees or I guess you wouldn't call them draftees anymore the prospects we'll call them prospects and the team so does it just become an outright bidding war for the top people in the in the country that might work because everybody should have a fair chance and when I'm thinking about it I feel as though there is there should be some kind of reform and I don't think that because you are good you should automatically be punished by having a lower draft pick um if I, because the point of a team is to win, right? So if I do my job and I build a winning team, why, why should I just automatically be pushed aside and let somebody who's had a worse team get the better players, and especially those who pers- purposely have been bad? So I think there might be something to this, but I, I need to know some more specifics to see. Yeah, it is kind of confusing. I mean, Stan Van Gundy came up with this idea to make it on an even playing field for all the cities, all the teams involved. But I just don't see how cities like Orlando, Sacramento, even Memphis are going to be able to compete on a, on, a, on an even playing field with some of the larger markets. I know that there's ways around that and everything. But for me, I think that the NBA draft, whether we think that this has a huge effect on tanking or not, has really been a staple and, and, and it's part of the framework for the NBA, and, and, and from my standpoint, it also generates a lot of money, not just the draft, but leading up to it, the coverage on, M- on M- MTV, on NBA <laughs> TV, throughout that and everything. So um, it's not necessarily the most ridiculous idea. It's a little far out there. I don't necessarily agree with it, but it's also, when you look at the way the salary cap is all built and, and, and all that and everything, it does get confusing when you look at the numbers and how everything plays out. Our photo of the week is a photo of the L.A. Lakers players locking arms during the national anthem before their exhibition opener at the Honda Center in Anaheim. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Now it's time for our New York Sports Report. You know, Mike, the news is often filled with a lot of bad news. So we have a feel-good story about our hometown Brooklyn Nets. And point guard Jeremy Lin bought suits for his teammates, coaches, video coordinators, physical therapists, and security guards. So um, his tailor, Abe Ndoye, who has been with Jeremy since his playing days in Houston, kicked off three days of measuring and advising so everybody will look fresh to death. So it turns out that this is not something that is really unusual because Quincy Acey did something similar with his D-League teammates when he got signed with the Nets, and Kevin... Garnett would do this with his rookies. 
I'm gonna have to send them my measurements so that I can get get a nice suit. Make sure you put it on Jeremy's <laughs> count, okay? <laughs> well, Keisha, keeping it in New York, Carmelo Anthony will not only be missed by some New York fans, but also at least one teammate, Lance Thomas. When Carmelo was traded to OKC, Thomas was so hurt that he wrote a heartfelt letter to the Players' Tribune thanking Carmelo. I was hurt when he left, Thomas said, not only having him as a teammate, but not having him here as one of my best friends. Keisha, are you surprised that Carmelo's departure has affected players in this manner? No, not at all. There were only two people that did not like Melo. Phil Jackson and the fans who thought he hogged the ball. <laughs> so, um, in all the time that Carmelo has been in New York City, I don't recall ever hearing any reports about him being a bad teammate, a bad person in the locker room. Even in the height of the chaos that was the Phil Jackson experiment, Carmelo was the consummate professional. He came in, he did his work he didn't quit on his teammates and he did what he could to not feed the frenzy i mean he stood up for himself in in certain ways but not anything that was overly derogatory um towards phil jackson so i didn't play on the team with him but i'm gonna miss him i'm gonna miss not hearing carmelo Anthony in the garden so um no i'm not surprised at all yeah neither am i i think carmelo as you pointed out i mean he Really was, uh, I, I felt while he was here, I mean, there were a lot of ups and downs, no question about that, but it was strictly basketball. I mean, there was never any, so, granted, he's had the issue with his personal life being thrown out there, but that's his business. I mean, for the most part, there was never any stuff that got thrown out there, or a lot of controversy or anything like that. So I think for the most part, the players on the Knicks, without a doubt, certainly were able to look up to him. And he had some good, he's not the type of rah rah leadership locker room type of guy, but he does lead by example, and there's no question with what Lance Thomas said that these guys on the Knicks granted the last couple of seasons were really tough here in New York for the Knicks but without a doubt Carmelo was one of the lone bright spots for the franchise it's official New York Mets manager Terry Collins is calling it quits as manager of the New York Mets and he's moving into the team's front office Prior to Collins' announcement, things had turned particularly ugly and anonymously sourced reports of sniping by players, which prompted David Wright, a former Met, to comment on the issue. Wright stated, It was cowardly, in my opinion. I have been very fortunate in my career. I haven't had too many gripes, but when I did, I went and talked to Terry or whoever the manager was. His door has always been open, and he's always listened. And Sandy Alderson was very angry about the anonymous bad-mouthing about Collins to the media. What do you make of this chaos? Well, I hope that these anonymous players took an opportunity to speak to Terry Collins face-to-face, but... Based on the tone of David Wright's quote, I think that that didn't happen. And that's really cowardly. You're a grown man. And from what I can tell by reading, Terry Collins was somebody who had an open door policy and would have welcomed the conversation. It's kind of like you kick a man when he's down. He's on his way out. And it was pretty clear in the beginning of the season or some way midpoint that this would most likely be his last season as the general manager of the Mets. So you're going to kick him down. And it's funny, like, I don't recall when the Mets were winning and going to the World Series just a couple years ago. I don't remember hearing all these terrible things about him. But now that they had a, a bad season, they want to point the finger at him. So what I would do is point the finger back at those people. But we don't know who they are because they are anonymous. But I point the finger back and say, well, what did you do? Well, how did you know what was your role in this season? How did you try to make things better? Did you did you bring this to attention? Because I'm sure you know I'm sure Terry Collins was not perfect in managing the team this year, but I'm sure he did the best that he can do, and probably would change some things differently. But sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So if you don't tell somebody what they're doing is is wrong or it could be done in a different way they don't know so they continue to go and then here you go you take the opportunity to kick him when he's down shame on you and when he's not around anymore and things aren't going well and you have nobody to blame then you know, what are you going to do then yeah i mean if it was anybody but david wright making these comments who wasn't with the team for a full season because he's been injured you know i would say hey wait a second you weren't necessarily part of the two th- 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 
2017 Mets. But someone like David Wright, who has been the face of this franchise for a number of years, one of the faces of this franchise for a number of years, he has a lot of say here, and he has a lot of pull without question. And as you pointed out, I mean, if you've got an issue with this guy, who is the manager of this team, you're with him 162 games, you're going on the road together, you're going in, and it's like you go into this season where they had so much high expect, so many expectations about how they were going to do. Terry Collins couldn't necessarily control some of the injuries that they had to their pitching staff. I thought that Terry Collins, in the time that he's been here as the Mets manager, I really thought that he overachieved. I thought it was a bad decision for them to bring him in a few years ago, and I thought everything except for this season, he did a very good job. He brought them to a World Series, and that definitely, even though they didn't beat the Royals a couple years ago, certainly there was the buzz was back in the in, in, for the New York Mets. And there were times over the last several years where they were more important in this city than the New York Yankees, no doubt about it. <laughs> mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner oh, soon. Please. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Now we are going a little off topic, and this is a follow-up to our conversation about the Kevin Hart cheating scandal. As you recall, Kevin Hart publicly admitted that he had cheated on his wife before the other woman could come forth and tell her story. So Hart's pregnant wife, Aniko Parrish, says that she does forgive Kevin, but it, it has taken a toll on her. A source told People Magazine, quote, she has been hounded by the press and is very upset. She is trying to stay healthy and enjoy her pregnancy, but the latest drama is too much. She is adamant about working through it, and she won't give up on their marriage. So, they recently had a baby shower for the upcoming baby. It will be a baby boy, and the name will be Kenzo Hart. And they have posted some pictures as a family, and it's all smiles. So, at least publicly, things are looking good for Kevin Hart. And she doesn't seem to be making him suffer, according to Instagram and social media. But we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, Mike. Well, I wish him the best. I like Kevin Hart, and I'm a big fan of his, and I hope that this is something that, uh, um, I, I forget where it was, but someone made the comment, I don't know if it was when we were speaking, that it's going to be easier for him to turn his career around than his personal life. So I think that certainly, I, I wish him the best, because I think that right here, this is something that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't like seeing people's business get thrown out into, into public like this. When you're a celebrity, I guess you can't help it. Right. Well, I guess love can conquer all. And we are a love face here. I love Mike. I love you guys. But I've got to say goodbye. Don't get mad at me because you can still keep up with us until we meet again next time by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 4 and 1 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hanging with you again.